Hello. Thank you for being here today. I am Director of Education, Shirley Hammond of the George Bush Presidential Library and Museum. The house behind me has a famous name because it is where presidents live while leading our country. Yes, it is called the White House. From 1989 to 1993, President Bush and his family, with first dog Millie, lived there. Now, let's hear some of Millie's stories in her book, Millie's Book, as dictated to First Lady Barbara Bush. Here is the cover of Millie's book. Barbara Bush and Millie are standing on the balcony at the White House. It's a lovely photo, isn't it? My name is Mildred Kerr Bush, and I came to live with the Bush family on February 13th, 1987. George Bush, who was then Vice President of the United States, knew that his wife Barbara, Millie prefers to call her Bar, missed her dog that had died, and she needed a dog. Barr had fallen in love with my English Springer Spaniel mother and sister when visiting with Will and Sarah Farish. So George called Will, and that is how I became Barr's dog. And two years later, I became the first dog. Will brought me from Versailles, Kentucky, and we met the Bushes at the foot of the steps of Air Force Two. It was love at first sight. Both Bushes kissed me and I sat on Barr's lap all the way to Maine. I'm going to be honest. This is a confession that is difficult for to me to make and you will understand why as you read on. Barr did whisper to me that night you are so sweet, but you are so ugly. Oh my, I knew immediately that I was going to have to try harder. She also told me that she really loved me. I believed her. That was sort of a rocky start, but I have since heard her tell others that she will never have a male dog again, and that I am the best dog they ever lived with. I believe that too. Several months after I arrived at the VP house, we got a letter from Benji, the famous dog movie actor, asking if he could come by for a courtesy call. He was on a tour promoting his latest movie. You can imagine my excitement. I would get to meet a real, live, macho movie star. We invited two of the grands, Jenna and Barbara, to bring over their Horace Mann kindergarten class to see the famous fella. He drove up in a big limousine, surrounded by aides, leaped out on command, as Barr pointed out, and then I discovered the awful truth. Benji turned out to be an aging 12-year-old female. To add insult to injury, she also turned out to be the nicest, best-behaved, friendliest dog I have ever met. The next day, papers had a big article and picture of Benji visiting the U.S. Marine barracks with the Marine mascot. I was barely mentioned, not that I cared. In the fall of 1987, Jenny and Barbara, George Jr., and Laura's twins moved to Washington. Their dad decided to work full time in George's presidential campaign. No title, just an ombudsman, and according to Barr and George, his assistant was an enormous help 
and gift to his father. It gets complicated in our family for we have three Georges, George the father, George the son, and George the grandson. For purposes of clarification, they will be known as George, Junior, although he isn't one, and George P. Very soon the campaign got going, and those of us who stayed at home really felt left out. I was thrilled to be invited to a Republican pet vet. At the party, I shared a chair with boxcar Willie Reagan, Maureen Reagan's dog, Blazer Luger, Senator and Mrs. Luger from Indiana's dog, and Congressman Helen Bentley's baby bleep Bentley from Maryland were also at our table. Posing for Vanity Fur, the stylish fashion magazine for dogs and cats, made me feel that I was giving my all for George. I spent a lonely fall in 1988. The Bushes were off campaigning almost all the time. On November 8th, when George was declared the winner, I got busy and decorated the house. Little did I know just exactly how much my life would change. For starters, Barr told me that I'd better get used to calling George Mr. President, which I do some of the time, strictly for protocol purposes. I have permission to refer to him as the Prez also. On Inauguration Day 1989, I was in Kentucky at Lane's Inn Farm with Tug Farish. Tug is an absolutely adorable Springer Spaniel chosen by Will Farish to be the father of my children. We got along very well. I stayed with Doug Drews, whom I have known from birth. Doug is really in charge of the garden at Lane's End, not in charge of visiting dogs who are in love. He drove me to Kentucky from the vice president's house and returned me to the White House. I felt that I'd miss all the excitement that had been going on. But Barr tried on her inaugural gown for me to see, well, that's not quite true. She wore it the night they received the diplomatic corps at a white tie reception in early February. And then the dress, her shoes, her stole, her famous real pearls, her earrings, and her beautiful evening gown bag went off to the Smithsonian for their permanent exhibit of First Lady's gowns. I tried to act as though I didn't care about her dress at all. The picture in the background here is of little Miss Ruth Harding. And she's actually no relation to President Harding. This is just one of the many wonderful paintings in the White House collection of art. Our life at the White House is pretty heavily scheduled. The alarm goes off at 6 a.m. The press says that I go off a few minutes earlier by shaking my ears pretty hard in their faces. In any case, Barr jumps up, throws on her clothes, and races down three flights of stairs. Or she takes the elevator if she feels a little tired. She usually feels tired. <laughs> she walks me around the South Lawn Drive, brings me back in, feeds me, and climbs back into bed to read the papers with the prez and drink coffee and juice. Between 7 and 7.08, the president and I go off to the Oval Office. I often sit in on the morning briefings. And these photos show me in the Oval Office 
Sometimes I want to go out and hunt for squirrels. I sometimes want to come in to take a break. The press says he gets pretty tired of letting me in and out. One day in early March, Barr and I went to our dear friends, Esther and Dick Moore's house for lunch. They surprised us with a puppy shower. The Moors knew something we didn't, for there were six of everything in the basket. I got pretty tired of waiting for tugs and my babies. One of the Washington newspapers had a puppy watch giving a daily report on my condition. I had a needlepoint chin cushion and waited like patience on a monument. My babies were born in the little beauty parlor on the second floor. This beauty parlor was put in by Pat Nixon and had been used by every first lady since, including Barr, in spite of what you hear, read, and see. The White House carpenters whipped up a marvelous nesting box for us. They'd made one before for President Ford's dog, Liberty. Barr brought her desk into that room and worked there. I spent days waiting and waiting and waiting. Finally, on March 17th and 18th, my pups were born, and I did have them in the proposed nest, although I would have preferred the bush's bed. Incidentally, my bed had a presidential seal on it, and theirs does not. The babies grew and grew. At first, they slept on shredded newspaper, but they got dirtier and dirtier from the ink. I'm afraid that Barr caused several newspapers great discomfort by mentioning publicly the fact that she enjoyed reading their newspapers, but hated the dirty ink. The Prez came to the rescue by getting rolls of unprinted paper for my babes. And that cleaned up their act considerably. As the weather got better, they spent hours on the South Lawn playing and sleeping. We carried them down in a great plastic toy bag. There they go in the toy bag. George, doggone it. The president took every opportunity to visit the pups. He brought out delegations of people who visited him. Sometimes he just sneaked out alone. And here is Millie on the South Lawn nursing her puppies. They were eating. Sometimes he played with the pups. It looks like they might have even taken a short little nap too, doesn't it? Sometimes the pups were let out for big runs on the lawn. They liked that so much that sometimes we had to carry them back in. I kept my eye on them. We started with six. And then there were five. Down it went to four. A sad little three. A good little twosome. And finally, a lonely little one. And oh, dark dog days, then there were none. Although I love all the grands, Marshall fast became a close friend. As soon as she could crawl, she'd get into my bed and I even let her play with my ball. Translation security blanket. Marshall sat with me while I waited for the pups. Everyone knows that that's a difficult time. She was there almost immediately after the delivery. 
Marshall visited the pups often. So on her third birthday, I gave her a puppy, Ranger, my only son. Ranger visits the White House often. After the babes were old enough for me to leave them for extended periods of time, Barra and I walked over to the old executive office building, the EOB, and visited the ladies and gentlemen in the mail room. The White House receives approximately 95,000 letters every month. Naturally, the press gets the most, but for a while, I was getting more than my fair share, so I went to say thank you very much. They even showed me my mailbox. May brought great honor to me. The babies and I were on the cover of Life magazine. I could only conclude that I was their selection for 1989 Mother of the Year. The babies and I looked smashing. I was glad to have a family picture before they all took off for new homes. If only Tug had been with us. Just when I was riding high, out of the blue, and with absolutely no provocation, the July 1989 issue of the Washington Magazine came out with their best and worst list. Guess whose picture was on the cover? Mine. Guess which I was. Best or worst? Worst. The president advised me to shake it off, ignore it, and not let it get my goat. The newspapers and the Bushes had lots of fun with the Washingtonian article. George immediately came to my defense. Barr was a little quieter, after which she had whispered to me that first night. I guess she felt this was one battle she should stay out of. The editors of the Washingtonian even apologized and sent me some marvelous dog biscuits. George accepted their apology. He wrote Jack Limpert, the editor of the Guilty magazine. Dear Jack, not to worry. Millie, you see, likes publicity. She is hoping to parlay this into a lassie-like Hollywood career. Seriously, no hurt feelings but you are sure nice to write. Arf, arf for the dog biscuits. Sincerely, George Bush. Easy for the president to accept the apology. I did not. It was bad enough to have my face on the cover, beside which they had written our pick as the ugliest dog, Millie, the White House mutt, but the picture they had inside was taken the very afternoon of my delivery. Show me one woman who could pass that test, lying on her side, absolutely bony wild, family expression for undressed, on the day she delivered six babies. I also objected to the word mutt. I am a blue blood through and through. For starters, my dad came from the kennel of Sir John Thurin. Sir John's secretary very kindly wrote and offered my dad Tug's baby pictures for my book. In her letter, she had one major piece of family news, and I quote, one tragic item, Tug's youngest brother, was given to a friend in Tallahassee, Florida, where he was eaten by an alligator. So sad. Well, I'll say that's sad. After the Washingtonian attack, we got lots of letters. One of my favorites came from an 82-year-old lady named Joy Fisk from Roseville, Minnesota. She enclosed a free verse poem that she composed in defense of ugly Millie, Barbara Bush, our first lady, has a Springer Spaniel puppy 
who was unjustly branded ugly by the Washingtonian magazine standards with Millie, beauty is more than fur deep. How poor Millie must suffer reading the writings of the editor of that prestigious magazine. Ugly Millie chuckles to herself. It is she who sleeps in the White House. It is she who eats the royal chow. It is she who knew her master's plan of the trip to Beijing and Moscow. The news writers of the Washingtonian magazine could not even guess the inner strategy and timing. Ugly Millie, resting at First Lady Barbara's knee, heard it all. Could it be jealousy? One of the great myths or misunderstandings about people in public office has to do with gifts. The law says that the president or any member of his family or any federal employee may not accept a gift from a foreigner that is worth more than $180. The law also states that he or she must declare any gift that he or she accepts from an American admirer that is valued at over $100. I have been given the most generous assortment of gifts, collars, leashes, a sweater marked Yale Bulldog? Why not Yale Springer? I ask. I have a personalized seat belt for when I go riding in a car, boat, or airplane. Well, the way George drives that boat, that's the only way I'd go out with him. Best be buckled down. I have been given many dog bowls, mostly personalized including a Waterford crystal one, and several biscuit jars filled with dog biscuits. We received many lovely t-shirts and sweatshirts that I assume are for bar, and wonderful cushions and beds, almost one for every room. So kind. Bar has been asked time and time again just how I got my name and just who is Mildred Kerr. The Bushes have named all of their children after best friends or beloved members of their families. They have named some of their animals the same way. Mildred Kerr is a dear friend of Barr's who lives in Houston, Texas. She told Barr that after Life magazine came out with my picture on the cover as the 1989 mother of the year, people came up to her in the store and called her Millie or Mill, that is, people who had never, ever spoken to her before. Since Millie is not her nickname, she was very amused. The birth of the puppies also brought several letters from other Mildred Kerrs. One wrote, may I ask you why you named your dog after me? It is causing me some embarrassment. The White House sits in the heart of the District of Columbia on 18.7 acres. I have loved running around these historic grounds. Every president since John Quincy Adams has planted a tree on the White House grounds. John's tree is looking a little poorly, but we are told that saplings from his tree are being saved for replacement purposes. That is the Adams tree directly behind me on the South Lawn. Incidentally, the bushes think the South Lawn is their front yard. Since we live on the second and third floors of the White House, you might well ask how I get up and down the stairs. It's easy. I just ring the bell for the elevator and there's Roland or Woody. Woody knows the name of every single member of the family. Sometimes the family leave me outside but Woody is always there. If the prez is due to arrive, I can't get Woody to budge, but everyone else can wait for me. The East Room at the White House is almost forbidden territory for me. This room has been used for a variety of purposes. The room is used primarily for entertaining, 
and has been the site of hundreds of receptions and musical performances. The grand piano in the East Room was presented to Franklin D. Roosevelt by Mr. Theodore Steinway on behalf of the Steinway family in December of 1938. This was the 300th Steinway built. Thinking back to the days when the pups were at the White House, May 16, 1989 was a landmark day in the life of the Millie Bush family. It was a wet, very rainy Washington day and my babies, Ranger and Cammy, were restless. Their sisters had already gone on to their permanent homes. They couldn't go outside on the South Lawn. So guess where they spent the morning? They were put in the East Room and all of the tourists got to see them. Do you think I was invited to be with them in the forbidden room? Absolutely not. As a matter of interest, about 125,000 people come through the White House each month and about 1,500,000 come per year. The White House is open to the public for tours. As I said, I'm not invited to the state floor very often. One day when I was banished to the upper regions of the White House, I got an urgent call to appear on the first floor for a formal reception. Casey Healy, Barr's personal assistant, told me that half the people going through the receiving line had asked for me or shown disappointment that they weren't going to see me. So Barr sent her to get me, although the Prez really doesn't like me to be at official receptions. I came down the grand staircase and waited until I was noticed. There were lots of ohs and ahs. And I tried hard to get in as many pictures as possible. After a while, I got bored and went into the green room for a rest. Incidentally, the green room is where Barr receives the spouses of the heads of state after their formal arrival for a cup of tea and a little get to know each other chat. The chair I chose was the one where the spouses sit. The press says, that this is just one reason why he does not want me to attend formal receptions. I heard the press say later, well, at least Millie stayed out of the blue oval room. Oh, later I went into the red room. The shiny material is very comfortable. By the way, in the past few years, the White House was accredited as a museum with honors under the very able leadership of its curator, Rex Skoten. I asked, what does with honors mean? And was told in short, this means that you are not to sit on any furniture. I was sorry I asked. The red room is next to the state dining room. The state dining room sees a lot of action in the White House. I came in one morning to see how the setting up for the state dinner of, for Australian Prime Minister and Mrs. Hawk was going on. The Hawk State Dinner was to be our first dinner held outside in the Rose Garden. But Mother Nature was against us. 98 degree temperature and 98% humidity. It was a shame as all my friends the electricians, the carpenters, the flower shop, the ushers, the social office, just everyone connected to a state dinner had worked for several days to set up the rose garden. Tiny little white lights were intertwined down the staircases on the south side of the White House, through the hedges that led to the garden and all through the crabapple trees that lined the garden. 
but all my friends said that it would be cruel and unusual punishment to ask people to attend a black tie dinner outside in that heat. There are some wonderful beds in the White House on the second floor. I have tried them all. The Lincoln bedroom has a large carved rosewood bed. All of the guests ask for that room, of course. However, Lincoln never slept in the bed or this as a bedroom. Until 1902, this room was an office. It was in this very place that the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. There is a handwritten copy of Lincoln's Gettysburg address on a desk in the Lincoln bedroom. President Lincoln copied the speech five times to benefit a charity for Civil War soldiers. He signed the fifth and final copy, and it is this copy that is in the White House. Although this is the room where the White House ghost is supposed to appear, the Bushes have not seen it, nor do they believe in ghosts. I must confess, I have not seen one either. I believe the president's favorite room in the White House is his upstairs office. This room is directly across from the grand staircase and visitors may be led up and into his office without having to run through all the booby traps set by the grands or by Barr and her friends. At different times in history, this room has been the office of the president, both Theodore Roosevelt and Franklin Pierce, to name a few, the cabinet room, and the treaty room, where the peace treaty with Spain was signed in this room on August 12, 1898. The president has filled this room with comfortable furniture and paintings. Here it is that George Healy's The Peacemaker Hangs. The Prez and I admire this painting and are inspired when we look at it. He is so inspired by it that when he addressed the 44th session of the United Nations General Assembly, he said, this is to quote him, there's a painting that hangs on the wall of my office in the White House, and it pictures President Abraham Lincoln and his generals meeting at the end of a war that remains the bloodiest in the history of my country. Outside, at the moment, the battle rages in this picture. And yet, what we see in the distance is a rainbow, a symbol of hope, of a passing of the storm. That painting is called The Peacemakers. For me, it is a constant reminder that our struggle, the struggle for peace, is a struggle blessed by hope. End of quote. Many other paintings in the president's residence office are of the West to remind him of his beloved Texas and of the sea to remind him of the rugged coast of Maine that he so loves as well. Speaking of Maine, there are two wonderful places in our lives that I have not mentioned. One is, of course, Kenny Bunkport. It is here that the Bushes get together with family, not just their children and grandchildren, but their mother, aunts, uncles, and cousins by the dozens. They love them all, and it, it is controlled chaos, to quote Marshall's dad. A more perfect description I have never heard. They compete in everything. Horseshoes, tennis, swimming, boating, stickball, and fishing for the wily mackerel or elusive big blue fish. Barr and the Prez love Kenny Bunport. She is a newcomer, of course, having only come there for 46 years. George, on the other hand, 
has come to Kennebunkport every year of his life since he was born, except for the year he was overseas during World War II. So not only his family are there, but also his friends. Now, his friends' children and grandchildren are playing with his. It is here that they all learn a lot and cherish a lot about the great worth of family, faith, and friends. This is naturally not my favorite place in the world. First of all, I do not want to share Bar and George with anyone. Why? I can hardly find room in my own bed in the morning, not to mention theirs. Every grandchild comes down in the morning and climbs in. Second, there is not a squirrel in the place. Groundhogs and skunks abound. I can't catch the former, and to my great sorrow, I did catch two of the latter. I detest the boat and have to be dragged on it. And they did that twice. The press says, never again. Who's arguing? So I spend lonely hours on the wall waiting for them to return. The best place in the world is Camp David. Absolutely no cameras are allowed there, so no pictures. But although we do have guests at Camp David, for the most part, I am allowed to join in all activities. I jog with the president. I go to his office and work in the mornings. I referee the horseshoe matches. I watch the bowling, tennis, golf, and swimming. I watch movies. I take long nature walks. I protect Bar and the Prez from the deer that feed down the hill outside our cottage. I give them a half-hearted chase. I spend hours watching the goldfish in the pond. And there are squirrels by the hundreds. I love Camp David. No book written by a bush dog would be complete without a chapter on name dropping. The late C. Fred Bush wrote in his book that he considered name dropping an art. Remember, we class name droppers never say, I know, let's say, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Rather, we say, Henry Kissinger knows me. There's sort of a subtle nuance there we like. Well, Henry Kissinger does know me. And there are a few others who know me, or my pups, kings and queens, presidents, and those who would be presidents, astronauts, governors, princes and princesses, actresses and actors, members of Congress, including the great Speaker of the House, senators and athletes, and some senators who are also athletes, big shots, Democrats and Republicans, members of the press, heads of state and their wives, secretaries of state, national security advisors, religious leaders, friends, they all know me or my pups. I overheard the Bushes talking the other night. Some discussion about me keeping a lower profile. The media were reporting that I was getting more publicity than some members of the cabinet. Well, considering some of my press, maybe they should be grateful. I could not finish my book without telling you a little about my pups, where they are and how they are faring. They all grew up loving flowers. I know they inherited that from me. They spread across the country. 
My daughter, Cammy lives in Miami, Florida with George P., Noel and Jebby. My daughter, Spot Fletcher, went to live in Texas with Jenna and Barbara. Spot was named after Scott Fletcher, who played for the Texas Rangers and was a favorite of the girls. As luck would have it, he was traded away, so the pup now is just called Spot. I think of her as Spot Fletcher. Spot is a big Texas Ranger fan. My daughter Barr lives at Lane's End in Kentucky and has risen to unexpected heights. She has met and been hugged by Queen Elizabeth II of Great Britain. My daughter BJ lives in Virginia with the Domingo Quicho family. She stays in touch and comes back to see me, but not often enough. My daughter Lady lives with Bernie and Patty Presick, who adore her. And Ranger lives with Marshall, so I see him often. It is true that I love to see them come visit, and it is even truer that I love to see them go home. One final thing I better make clear. I know the Bushes love me. They told me so. But they love people more, all people. So I have written this book, and the proceeds will go to help people all people. I hope it will strengthen families and family life in our great America. The Prez used to tease Barr and tell her that if she'd stick with him, he'd show her the world, and he did. The Prez told me that if I'd stick with him, he'd show me my name in a thousand points of light, and he did. All of the proceeds will be donated to the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy. The mission of the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy is to support the development of family literacy programs, to break the intergenerational cycle of illiteracy, and to establish literacy as a value in every family in America to help every family in the nation understand that the home is the child's first school, that the parent is the child's first teacher, and that reading is the child's first subject. We wish everyone happy reading. It's been a pleasure to bring this program to you from the Education Department of the George Bush Presidential Library and Museum.